behind that. But I mean, do you want to address briefly, like what what would the democratic like what what are those proposals what are the implications of them i mean my only read i just want to put this into the mix is something like you know people forget that the root of stop and frisk in new york city which mm-hmm. you know is a universally or not universally but broadly understood to be you know a uh, racist policing tactic which in fact was struck down by a court and even somewhat reformed by mayor de blasio that has its roots in anti-gun program. So, you know, I think it's a very valid concern that people say, well, what is on tap? Does this just become another sort of, I mean, all of the racial and class dynamics we could put in, but even just more broadly, another area of responsabilization and putting on individuals and not as an example on, you know, the American gun cartel. I'm not interested in demonizing individual gun owners at all. I am very concerned about these companies. That's right, and that, that's, that's like so key, right? And this talk about, again, other like implicit logics, which are more than just neoliberalism, but like a certain type of double bind, where you hear people saying the common democratic response is, these weapons of war, talking about AR-15s, do not belong on our streets. Where they belong. <laughs> exactly. That becomes the question, right? And even Chuck Schumer, like, bless his heart, um, you know, <laughs> has, has, has pre- previous years gone to bat for Remington, for assault rifle manufacturers in his districts, because they're all American companies that employ yep. Americans for jobs. And, like, you can't have it both ways on these things, right? You, you, you can't simultaneously be like, these weapons are very, very bad, and they should not be used against Americans, but also I love making them, and please let me take money from manufacturers or from arms industry lobbyists. Like, that, you can't do both these things at once. Um, so, like, that's why, like, again, like, chips will cash out differently in terms of how various debates play out, but the lack of clear voices being like, all these objects are bad. This entire situation is for Cocto. The lack of that predisposes the, d- the discussion to go in certain directions. But that said, um, and I will say, too, like, I-, I hear you on the question of racialized enforcement, and there's... The answer to this is complicated. I, I, I struggle with it myself. I will flag first, though, that like this is a type of internal conversation that, that you and I are having, and that a lot of Democrats will acknowledge, or like you know, ones who are good faith and savvy. You don't hear that same type of internal dialogue on the right. Where, like, are we proposing something a little too hasty that might have adverse consequences? I mean, today uh, on the day of the no. year anniversary, we killed, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah exactly. of course like, not. Yeah. It, it, it's yeah. just like it's very weird where it's like both the, the objections that are pr- proffered to gun control or to even talking about gun control, like imagine them on any other issue. And like today, the 16th right. anniversary of our launching a war based on nothing that killed a million people. And right. people are, and we didn't like, you know, people are being like, well, we shouldn't do anything about guns because there are a lot of innocent people that might be negatively affected by their inability to buy an AR 15. I'm like, there are a million dead Iraqis that we didn't question what would happen to them before we launched it. Like, there's a kind of, there's a weird double bind we put ourselves in. But, but independently of that, uh, vis-a-vis this question of, like, what we can do about this, my answer more and more is, like, well, first, the political stuff has to happen. There has to be people being like, this entire situation is wrong, right? That, so that, that, like, moral voice needs to be there. Getting into the specific stuff about policy, you're absolutely right. It, it has been totally the case that uh, gun control legislation in the 20th century from, you know, for, from, Reagan reacting against the Black Panthers, to the assault weapons bill getting bundled with the crime bill omnibus under Clinton, to the advent of stop and frisk. But it's always been a, there's always been an aspect of racialized enforcement. And so the question becomes for leftists is like, how much can we, maybe gun control isn't the right way to be talking about this. Maybe dealing with gun deaths is the way to be talking mm-hmm. about it. Maybe dealing with the question of violence is the way to talk about it. So the question then becomes very granularly, what are things that we can do that will actually lower the number of gun deaths that don't also give ground and empower the carceral policing state, right? Um, yeah. And to their credit, a lot of these kids in Parkland are like, well, we don't want school resources officers. Like, they don't want to feed the pipeline either. And yeah. that's, that's very hard to hear. Yep, yep. I mean, maybe uh, elaborate on that sort of hopeful note, because I think that, you know, with the Parkland students, I mean, it's striking the way these students have emerged on a number of levels and we don't, you know, we'll figure it out. And, you know, they're obviously super young, really savvy. Uh, maybe they say some things that, uh, I disagree with from time to time, but that that's totally secondary to, first of all, the fact that they're taking power into their own hands and doing solidarity, just like you were pointing out in the beginning, they're de responsibility. Like their very act 
of banding together is a rebuke of all this neoliberal garbage. And they're, um, you know, they have actually emerged from this story like, I know way more about them than I do about the shooter. I, you know, they're just objectively more interesting to hear from than the same, you know, horrible hack NRA propagandists or, you know, middling, you know, kind of democratic whatever. Uh, they've got the actual charge and the vitality behind them. And they are making some of those distinctions you were pointing out. So, you know, maybe leave us, there is that hopeful note maybe there to leave us on. Yeah, I mean, like, I think the kids, the kids are, the, the kids are all right. You know what I mean? They're yeah. being amazing. Um, yep. And I, I don't want to put them on too much of a pedestal. I'm not saying you're doing that, but I, I want to be, be clear. Like, what they are asking for and what they need is solidarity rather yep. than like deference, right? Right, right, right. Um, right. They need people to go back, go to the back from all these different ways. But like, in terms of things that we can do concretely, first off, I think like it's important to remember that the problem of gun violence is not the same thing. It, it, the problem of mass shootings is only a subset of the broader problem of gun violence. Yep. And there's a way in which a lot of the conversation about mass shootings specifically becomes a way of avoiding talking about gun violence more broadly, right? Where there's an implicit thing where we, we just want to keep the violence in the play, in, in like the in the urban hyper ghettos where it belongs implicitly. We have to reject that. So like the answer is to look at the problem of gun violence in terms of it actually being a problem that affects different groups in different ways, and then doing targeted interventions that deal with all those individual groups. So specifically, there are a lot of community activism programs that have been shown, proven to inter to, to do what's called violence interruption yep. against urban gang violence. That works, and it doesn't necessarily involve the police. That's great, right? In vis-a-vis -vis suicide, there have been a lot of unlikely movements, oftentimes within red states and even among gun shop owners, to, to attempt informally and otherwise to stop people who, who appear to be ready to kill themselves from buying guns, or at least, you know, can I hold this for you for several days? That also appears to have a real value at working, right? And then at the same token, too, talking about, like, what are the drivers of violence and acting out, to, try to, to basically have points of intervention that deal with the misery of life that impels people to go ahead and, and become murderous rampagers, but to, to stop that earlier, to make them value their own lives more, to make them feel that they have a sense of possibility, to make them feel heard, right? And the trick is to do that through investment, to do that through giving people opportunities that are not just these sort of like sham neoliberal opportunities, but actually treat people like they're something other than just a number on a balance sheet. So like there are a whole suite of different policy interventions we can do, but the real thing is just to, to understand that this, is a, this, this problem keeps on happening. It's not reducible just to the mass shootings that get headlines and to have a, basically an intersectionally conscious awareness of the different people whose lives are affected by it.